Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the eight hour chart of silver on Netdania. And you can see that for the first time, we're, it's starting to look like we may get a sell off here. Uh, let me draw in another trend line here, real quick. That's going to be right about here. And that one's clearly violated. So, this tight pennant has been broken. Uh, there's a looser pennant that is just barely broken. And then there, of course, there's a further pennant that comes down to right about here. And it's looking more likely that we're going to get a test of at least that $18 price and perhaps $17.25. So this is actually really good news because doing the research today, I isolated a coin that I'm very, very interested in buying right now. So we're going to cover that later. But uh, we're going to watch Sunday nights open. It, it could be a good drop. And I have to remind everybody about how silver works on price drops. They're usually very, very um, uh, short-lived. So very good buying opportunities. They don't last very long. Those are the times I like to stack. Usually, as I said before, when I see a series of red candlesticks on the minute chart, usually I go to the minute chart when I'm live time. And when I'm seeing just a series of falling red, something like this area right here, and then massive volume coming in in the face of that, such as something like that, then I start to get an itchy trigger finger. I, I can't really, it's one of those things that's kind of intuitive. I can't really tell you what it is that causes me ultimately to pull the trigger, except that prices have dropped so drastically, so fast, that I just can't help myself. So we're gonna cover what I think is a fantastic buy right now, and uh, I haven't seen a fantastic buy for quite some time, so I'm pretty excited about this. But before we do that, I wanted to address this issue of the executive orders. This is something that was discussed on a recent Rob Kirby interview. I think that Bix Weir touched upon this, but uh, the story is that there was an executive order issued. Now, we haven't really covered this executive order thing. And this, this goes very deep. It, it has to do with a corruption of the fundamental structure of the Republican form of government that we have. And it also, in my opinion, kind of goes into some Bible prophecy because there's some indications for me with a certain reading of Isaiah 18 and other verses such as Daniel 7 and others that at some point a strong dictatorship is going to emerge in the United States. That's a real sketchy thing. I haven't done a, a Bible prophecy study on that specifically, so I can't flesh it out right now. But for me, there are a number of verses that point to a the emergence of a dictatorship over both Britain and the United States. Now, executive orders are orders that are issued by the president supposedly under the auspices of the office having the power over the agency powers. In other words, uh, the president is in charge of enforcing the law. That's the executive department. And when it comes to agencies, which are sort of arms of enforcement, then issuing policy for the agencies is kind of a sketchy area. So that's how executive orders kind of sneak in the camel's nose under the tent. And we're already kind of going towards the direction of rulership by one person. And it's quite possible that if Donald Trump wins the presidency, that that will be a huge push to give him more power to do what he needs to do. That might be what's behind this whole thing. I don't know. But these executive orders that were issued, I want you to note here that the recent comments about this were about the order of succession that was uh, granted in regards to the Treasury. But the first thing I want you to notice here 
is that there was an order of succession granted on that same day uh, by uh, the president on August 12th for not just the Department of the Treasury, but for the Department of Veterans Affairs and for the Environmental Protection Agency. So for me, I don't really see a big story in this as far as the Treasury. It doesn't seem to be a Treasury-centered story. It seems to be more of a continuity of government uh, issue and that is important because Rob Kirby has pointed out what what happens if maybe the election is put off now that story comes up about as often as the election cycle itself I remember that story coming up back in the second term of President Clinton and it probably came up even during Reagan's term where conspiracy theorists are discussing that the president is going to declare martial law, suspend the Constitution, and there won't be an election. That really comes up about every four years. So the odds of it happening are very, very low. Now, we're going to talk about a low-odds event that, in my opinion, is going to happen in the gold and silver markets. But again, at any particular point in time, a low-odds event is, by definition, very, very unlikely to happen. And I think it's highly unlikely that the this next election is going to be suspended. So what do I make of these executive orders? I just make that it's a strengthening of the executive branch and it's the executive branch just getting more involved in a continuity of government uh, and making sure that the operations that we have continue. I don't place a lot of importance on this. Now the next story I want to talk about is this Zero Hedge article. It's entitled, Why Gold is Going Higher in Six Charts. And this, for me, is it is pointing to a very, very important event. This is an event that we've all, at least in the alternative silver space, have predicted is coming, is going to happen, is going to be a event that comes out of nowhere and the magnitude of the event is going to be astronomical and this one's about gold but i want to take the logic that's in this article and then apply it to silver so let's read this this is why gold is going higher in six charts by stephen mcbride of maudlin economics six charts that show the number one reason gold is going higher Asset prices are at all-time highs around the world. Since 2008, assets under management have increased by a whopping 43%. The reason? Institutional investors have been taking advantage, gobbling up all they can get. And there's a chart of global assets under management. But while institutions have been on a buying spree, there's one asset they have neglected. And best of all, there's no risk attached to owning it. Best performing asset ignored. This asset is considered the best investment of 2016. It's outperformed the S&P 500 and the U.S. dollar by 19% and 29% respectively. It is also the only financial asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. That asset is gold. Up 26% year to date. However, as a percentage of global financial assets, it's at near all-time lows. And here's the chart. This is the chart of gold gold as a percentage of financial assets and you can see we've covered this many times it's good that they have this this one line here back to 1960 where it actually was five percent of global financial assets you can see we're now hovering at about a half a percent so we're actually hovering around uh, 10 percent of what it was in 1960 in 1980 during the massive move of gold up to $850 an ounce, you can see even though gold ran from that peg price, that low price of $35 an ounce, all the way up to $850 an ounce, that's more than a 20-fold move. It didn't manage to overtake its previous high, a percentage of financial assets. It actually only made it halfway. So gold didn't even return to its historical norm. But let's keep reading. Gold made up 5% of global financial assets in 1960. Today, it's a meager 0.58%. If that figure returned to its 1980 figure of 2.74%, that would translate into an additional $2.5 trillion flowing into gold and gold stocks. 
That's eight times the current market cap of the entire gold industry, which now stands at $324 billion. Now, I want you to note that they're including gold with gold stocks. I don't include gold stocks with gold because for me, gold stocks aren't gold. Gold stocks are claims on very, very questionable assets that not only have financial risk, they have accounting risk, they have political risk, and they have government and international risk and military risk. There are so many risks in owning gold stocks that it's ridiculous to talk about gold stocks in the same sentence that you're talking about gold. So this number is much, much worse or better, if that's the perspective, than the one they're giving here. But continuing, with the current uncertainty, NERP and ZERP gold is once more seen as a hedge against inflation. Since the bear market began in 2011, demand for gold bullion and coins has increased, but investment demand has stayed low until now. And here's a gold demand chart with the first quarter of 2016. You can see it taking off there. Investment demand for gold rose 122% from the first quarter of 2015 to the first quarter of 2016. Money flowing into gold ETFs jumped over 300%. However, we haven't seen capital migration from general financial assets into gold. So where have these bullish inflows come from? The biggest hedge funds are flocking into gold. And he mentioned Stanley Druckenmiller, George Soros. I think uh, today we had Paul Tudor Jones who's shorting stocks and uh, perhaps he's buying gold. We don't know yet. Pension funds are pushed into a corner. The task of pension funds is to generate stable growth over the long term. This has become increasingly hard with volatile equity markets and low to negative bond yields. During economic turmoil, investors have usually turned to bonds. Gray areas indicate recession. And this is the chart. You can see that the bond yields continuously fall. And we're definitely on par for another recession here. But with yields at or below zero, they are no longer yielding real returns for funds. Although equity markets have risen, general sentiment has been cautious given the recent volatility. Pension funds in the U.S. totaled $22 trillion at the end of 2015. As a result of poor performance, they are now running a $3.4 trillion deficit. The reality is that traditional yield sources are either non-existent or too volatile. Where will the pension funds find a way back to profitability? What happens if pension funds shift just 0.3% of assets into gold? The typical pension fund is estimated to hold about 0.15% in gold and another 0.15% in gold mining companies, a total of 0.3% of their overall holdings. If the U.S. pension funds doubled their gold holdings to 0.6%, this would mean an extra $132 billion flooding into the market. Now, I want you to take this figure. We're not going to continue this article, but the numbers are staggering. And I want you to take the arguments that are applied to gold here and apply them to silver. Now, it's going to be my contention, and this is just kind of an intuitive guess, but it's going to be my contention based on Eric Sprott's observation that dollar for dollar buying of gold and silver physical coins is equal, that I'm going to contend that there's just as much money going to be flowing into silver as flows into gold when this thing happens. And we've already discussed how they're putting the mining stocks in with the physical metal. But so I think whatever explosive factor we have for gold here, and uh, I think they're talking, talking about roughly a doubling of the price of gold, anyone's guess. But for me, the factor with silver is probably going to be the equivalent of what the gold-silver ratio is going to be. That's just a gut estimate. For me, that's anywhere from 50 to 100 times. If this event occurs, then I expect to see a 50 to 100 times move in the price of silver based on that. Where does that put us? I did some rough calculations. It puts us anywhere from $1,500 an ounce silver to $3,000 an ounce silver if an equal amount of pension fund money flows into physical silver as it flows into physical gold. So do your own math. That's just my speculation. So let's get to the last story. For me, this is really big because I've followed the Lunar series for a long time. 
that's my favorite series more than any other series. The uh, Perth Lunar series is my absolute favorite for so many reasons I've already covered. I'm not going to talk about them right now. But uh, I was doing my usual checking, and I was looking to see why. The first thing I noticed was that when I was on Atmex and JM Bullion and Provident, that the one-ounce monkeys were very highly priced. Now, it's not surprising. We can see here that the monkey is sold out. It has that 300,000 limitation, and that's been in force for quite some time. It goes all the way back. I don't think we'll even find it here. But there was a point in time, you can see we're back at the mouse of 2008. I think at one point it was expanded up to 300,000. But we've been at 300,000 maximum mintage for quite some time and the cheapest one ounce goats we can find are around $35 an ounce, $34, $35 an ounce. Clearly they're sold out. Most of the sites they're sold out. You can still find a couple of them available but they're being doled out. And, and that's the reason why I a number of years ago decided to concentrate mainly on the half ounce for me, the half ounce was better than the two ounce simply because it's cheaper. And for me, if I could have four half ounces for the same price, I could get one two ounce. I would definitely take the half ounces. That's just a gut instinct and uh, I can't really explain it. There are some reasons for it, but it's just kind of past experience and gut instinct. Now, the big standout here, I just want to show you the big standout for me on these mintage numbers. And for me, mintage numbers are really important. Uh, they're not as important as some other things, but they're one of the most important things when you're talking about a semi numi or numismatic coin. Now, the big shocker here, I'm just going to review what we had. We're, we're year to date for 2015, uh, 2016. But by doing some comparisons, we can get a rough idea of where we are in the year. So if we look at the Silver Goat series from 2015, we're going to look at, we'll skip the 10 ounce, we'll just do the, the 5 ounce, the 2 ounce, and the 1 ounce and the half ounce. So the 1 ounce is irrelevant because it's always sold out. So re remember these numbers. At the 5 ounce, we had 16,000. At the 2 ounce, 61,000. And the half ounce we had 188,000. So that's a pretty easy one to remember because they sold roughly three times the number of five ounces uh, as uh, for two ounces. Two ounces sold roughly three times the number of the five ounces and the half ounces sold roughly three times the number of the two ounces. Now let's go down and look at the current year. This is year to date and you can see that they've sold 11,000 five ounces They've only sold 10,000 two ounces and they sold 127,000 half ounces. So the thing that's really going to jump out to you, that jumped out to me, is the numbers on this two ounce coin. This is a shocker. They have not sold hardly any of this coin and these coins are minted on demand. They have an unlimited mintage. That means they mint them when they run out. When Atmex or Gainesville or whoever orders them, the second party or third party doesn't have any in stock, they go back to the Perth Mint and say, I need some more, and they mint them on demand. So this is the big shocker here. Now, the question you would naturally ask is, how far are we in the year? Well, this number is going to give you some idea. At 127,000 half ounce, and last year, was 188,000, let's just assume those numbers are going to be the same, then that's pretty good. That gives us about two-thirds of the way through the year to three-quarters. So my contention is that these numbers are actually accurate to where we are in the year. The, the half ounce is going to end somewhere near there. The two ounce should end somewhere near there, but it's not going to even be close. Look at the five ounce, 16,000. Let's look at it down here, 11,000. Again, roughly two-thirds of the way through the year. So this is the big one, the two-ounce lunar monkey. So let's look at it. Do we have any available? Well, in fact, we do. We have about 136 available over at Atmex for 55.75. That's not too bad. If we just 
say we have a $20 price, which is probably going to be the snapback after the drop if we get one, then that's $40 two ounce silver. That's roughly $7.50 premium. Yes, it's high, but for a coin that has that much promise, that's a pretty good deal. The other ones that we have available are over here on uh, JM Bullion. And if you do the total, we got 390 there, and the price is 5528. So this is going to be the coin to watch for me. Honestly, to tell you the truth, you could buy every one of these coins available right now at this price. And in my opinion, it's a can't lose proposition. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I do have the funds available. I'm not going to pull the trigger. If members snap them all up, oh well, that's fine. I'll wait and see if more come available. If they don't, I can take a pass on that. But if there are some available, when I think we get something like the decent price drop that's predicted by this chart here on the eight hour, then if we get a correction down to here, I will buy some. And if we get a correction down to here, I may even back up the truck because uh, there's definitely a dearth of Perth at this point in time. And we'll talk to you next time.